Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Nathan George. Nathan is the CEO of Void Robotics and a good friend of mine. Nathan, welcome to the pod. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on again, buddy. It's been a while. Yeah, but it's been good. Working a lot and, you know, making robots as always. So uh, Who here among us isn't working a lot and making robots as always? <laughs> yeah. So what are some of the things you're working on lately? Uh, working on a few projects, uh, probably. So the, t the two main projects I'm working on, one of them is something I'm calling void plants. Essentially it's a data solution for, for, for plants, uh, mostly for consumers. We're eventually going to add automatic watering into it too. And we're trying to lower the cost as well. So just a bunch of little stuff there. The other main project we're working on is called void walking. Um, so yeah, we have, we have one client and we're working on trying to essentially move stuff outdoors using rtk gps so yeah cool fun so that's more of a void walking thing right you're trying to use rtk gps for localization yeah cool yeah that's awesome um what's the reason for that particular i think i have an idea but you know in your own words like why why use that sensing modality instead of like a slam or or something what yeah I, I get i get that question a lot actually yeah. it's 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 a it's a good question so basically, um, so this company, I believe this company tried tried working with Slam, like let's say Lighter Slam or Visual Slam. I know I have. I worked with Visual Slam for for three years. Um, so as, essentially, one uh, with I don't I'm not sure if I can mention the details of the project, but essentially, with Visual Slam, one of the issues that I faced was that it tended to be a little bit inaccurate. So let's say. Um, usually a foot or so of, of an accuracy and that could be you can you can fix that with enough tuning or enough sensors like you add encoders or you add like another sensor like a lidar um one of the biggest issues i faced with outdoors was when the if you had too many features of so, you know visual slam you have to create a bunch of features it tends to eat up the ram and it causes the whole system to slow down so in my opinion it's definitely possible with this particular project in the accuracy needed to get really low so the, the accuracy needed to be down to like um probably a max of like 10 10 centimeters maybe even lower like three to five to three to five centimeters so the system that we're building essentially is using rtk gps as it can just um in, instead of having uh, relying on loop closure which um, in, out, in, in certain outdoor environments, at least the one that I'm working in, there's just not enough unique features. So the, the one that, so in that environment, you, could just, you can just essentially loop close using the satellites. And then we're also gonna add like just regular uh, object detection using uh, the, the stereo cameras. That's pretty awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, to be honest, like your point about the RAM is, is definitely an accurate one and compute resource in general, I mean, you know, there's somebody said to me like, a few years ago something I really liked, and I forgot who said it, and I feel like like a schmuck for that. But it was, um, you know, you know, give a perception engineer some compute, and they'll find a way to ask for more. You know, <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty funny. But um, yeah, I mean, to your point, right? Like RTK corrected GPS is way less computationally intensive. It's way easier to program. It takes way less you know kind of guesswork i mean you sort of know what your accuracies are um you can be up and running outdoors a lot faster uh it's cheaper in terms of the sensors you need to do it right um there's tons of reasons i mean i just kind of wanted to hear yours which is why i asked it open-ended but i think it gets kind of a bad rap like everybody's like oh you know it, it does yeah. gps denied environment I'm like well how often are you operating in a GPS denied environment? You know, it's like you know, most of the time you're in a, out in the field doing farming or, you know, construction or, or something, and, and you have access to a GPS constellation. Yeah, I actually started my the, the, this project. It was originally a, a Visual Slam uh, product that I was trying to sell, because 
a lot a lot of people mentioned that it's like oh and gpness deny environments but then i realized i'm not really selling to anyone that needs that um i, I mean the even the government you know they 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 use a lot of gps related well, technology they, i mean they fielded it right like that's that's it is yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah so i was thinking well i was trying to shift away from a general product to something that a specific customer needed and there was a specific customer that that wanted something like this so then i found another customer and i'm working with them on that and yeah, so long as it works and nothing else exists on the market i guess hopefully it'll it'll end up working out so so that's pretty neat so you've managed to find customers that are willing to bootstrap your product development efforts <laughs> effectively yeah i would say only one only one right now it's it's not uh, too crazy i found a lot of people interested in the product because it's you know generic outdoor navigations um but yeah the the cost to develop is hard so we're we're, we're developing it pretty slowly but that's actually where my internship program comes in <laughs> I still have that. I actually scaled it down quite a bit. I, I only had probably like 20 or 30 interns this year. What? How many um, did you have last year? Last year was 67. Okay. Okay. I remember because you were telling me like those kind of numbers the last time we did this. Yeah. So that's fun. I was thinking about scaling it up, but I wanted to do some other stuff. So yeah, we still have like 20 or 30 interns. So yeah, if there's any uh, master's level uh, peop uh, students interested in robotic software uh then you can apply you can just reach out to me but um we also started expanding into other stuff so i have internships in uh hardware and electronics and also internships in uh, uh sales but th oh, those sweet. are just those are just starting up um there's just a lot of people that reach out to me looking for internships so that was essentially why i started that so. sales is interesting i don't think i've ever seen a sales internship program in my career just because yeah, like, I don't know very yeah. many companies that would trust an intern to be in charge of their sales. I'm not saying it's bad. Like if you can crack that, I feel like you could even incentivize on commission, you know, because if you get somebody, you know, like why wouldn't you give them a piece and, and let them, you know, taste that victory? Yeah, that, that's actually what I did. So with the with the engineering interns, I mentioned it's unpaid because um, there's no direct line to money. So I can't it, it's, it's a bit of a risk. But for this uh, sales intern, I actually just uh, onboarded them today. Uh, it is it is based on commission, so it's ten percent commission, which is I think fairly high, especially for an intern. But you're right about the trusting them. That's that is one concern I have. My current approach is to just, just take a very uh, like uh, systematic way. So I give them a training uh, program that I'm, I created, and then I also kind of watch everything that they send out, and. I'm assuming some of them will have some issues, but you know, assuming it's fine, then they'll reach out and basically a similar to an SDR, a sales development representative. I hope it's going to be the same thing. So we'll see. That's an interesting way of doing it. I mean, how did you, uh, how did you recruit for that? Oh, they, they just reach out to me. Oh, that's interesting. And you're like, just this person my LinkedIn. seems like they know what they're doing. So I'll give them a, give them a shot. Yeah. There, I did get a lot of, uh, that, like a lot of, like let's say um, people who I don't think are qualified to work for me. Like I was, I was just talking with somebody else who I almost decided to onboard and, and pay him. Uh, he wasn't an intern. He was just a normal uh, sales guy. But yeah, some of the, when we had conversations, it was a lot of like talking. He's a nice guy for sure. He's a very nice guy, but it was a lot of like talking over, trying to change everything about my business. Did he, he didn't have any um, actual, like sales in this area yet so i was just like eh, i'm not sure if that'll work out but i i told him like i do want to work with you in the future but just not right now percent you know collaborative with spencer kraus is sponsored by ska robotics if you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise please consider hiring ska robotics they sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world ska robotics can be found at skarobotics.com I've been learning that principle a bit more recently too. There's this one guy specifically; he's so smart. Like I, I, I don't, I can't, I can't stress like how smart this guy is. He's he's from a developing country, so he his his rate is is quite low actually. Um, but man, like he he, I give him my hardest problems, and he solves them like ten times faster than I expected him to. Like I'm not even kidding when I say he's solving problems so fast that it's actually like sl like slowing me down because of how much I have to review his work. Oh, that's which interesting. Is good, which is a good problem to have. I don't usually have that problem, by the way. Usually, it's like my engineers might not know how to solve a hard problem or something. But yeah, but this, this, so I've been, yeah, it, 
is he validated or is he just doing like the chalkboard version or both no he he does everything he he creates the like i just gave him a general problem he he creates a plan he solves the plan he validates it with an image because i could i ask him to do that and then he makes the the pr and and that's it and and it's just him specifically though so i've been learning that like if i just find the right people who are really good um then I could start to move in that direction where I could be, I, I do manage a lot, but I could be even more of a manager. Um, but he's such a nice guy. Like that's, that's the best thing. He's like such a nice guy. And um, just not so, pretentious or cocky about it, but you know, I don't even think he has the ability to do that. Like, he, <laughs> like I, you know, like it's so, and I love working with those kind of guys. Can I ask where so. he's from? Just out of curiosity. Uh, yeah, he's from the Philippines. Oh, cool. Yeah, they awesome. have a really, they have a really good. Pro, uh, I don't know what they're doing, but I, I just know so many people say they have guys from the Philippines. Um, Do you think so. just they've got like some really good universities out there, or like maybe there's just? I personally have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's I, an English-speaking with... country, so yeah. like that opens it up to like U.S. engineering markets. Yeah, I've worked with two guys from the Philippines. They were both super smart. So that's interesting. Yeah, no, I've heard good things about a bunch of Filipino dev teams that um, some of my friends have worked with, too. So that's that's interesting. I mean, like not to stereotype a whole country, but. You know. Yeah. And and I think it's good to 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 like, you know, to mention that, too, because like I know I know there's a lot of stereotyping against like getting bad devs, especially from India. Like I hear that a lot, especially like, oh, you, like, you, like you don't want to reach out to devs from these countries because like they're there's they're slower or something but i do think there's a lot of truth in that because i don't want to fully say it's wrong like you could just you, you can hire a team because i think if you hire another team from another country there it, it's not always the best because they don't necessarily they, they they just hire you know individuals yeah but what i found what i found to be really good and this is just my approach so far is find individuals so find individuals and and you, you know you qualify them somehow however you want to do it yeah it- and you just keep those individuals. It's perfect. I love. It's it's like the best yeah. thing in the world. Well, I mean, your overhead's a little higher on management, but yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. it's way lower on labor. And so, um, I mean, the other yeah. thing too is, I mean, I've seen plenty of shitty developers in the U.S. Like you know, like no no shortage of yeah. like everywhere. I think you know, it's just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, you get that. You know, eighty twenty rule, or what? Like you know, twenty percent of your people are doing 80 percent of the work and so you know you find that and leverage on it and you know, find that top performing one percent or whatever basically yeah that's that's the key is finding is finding that talent and I, I think you're really good at that though you seem to find a lot of good people like uh obviously you know i worked with you on that one project and thanks yeah some other stuff. pleasure to work well, with as well the, yeah i mean j- just the projects that you guys get is, is really impressive so Appreciate they'll be that, doing your works so yeah Thanks. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's a combination of what you said with, you know, just finding really good people and, and keeping them happy and, and creating lasting relationships and, and doing the right thing. But then also, you know, just doing the same thing on the customer side. So, you know, finding the right yeah. customers that are easy to work with and maybe easy is the wrong word, but like pleasant to work with, um, you know, demanding is OK so long as those demands are rooted yeah. in reality and you know, something that, you know, my people can get their heads around. So, I mean, it's one thing, I think, to have a high level of standard. And I think that's even like a merit to me, right? I, I would much rather work with a customer that appreciates quality than not. But it's another to be like a schizophrenic, you know, customer or manager where, you know, you demand one thing one day and then, you know, a, a totally different thing the next day. And, and you know, you pick favorites and, you know, maybe, you know, this person is, is great now and, and now they're the devil. Like, I, I would say, like, you don't want to be that way. So, and I don't know. Yeah, I actually had a question about that, too. Have you found that if the budget increases, like the budget for the project, as it increases, do you feel that the that the client gets better or worse in, in those respects? I don't think it well, makes I a hope... difference, right? I, I think, like, oh, at really? every price point that I've worked at, you know, you've got amazing people and you've got jerks, uh, you know, and maybe that's a little too generalistic. I mean, yeah. you know, hopefully I, I don't get in too much trouble for saying schizophrenic in that context either because I have schizophrenic friends, nothing against, you know, mental illness or anything. But yeah, I'm talking right. about the sporadicness. Um, but I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is um, 
I don't think it. I don't think that makes a difference. Um, I, I think you know you can do more with a bigger budget. You know, you can you can recruit higher end talent. Um, you can, you know, buy higher end components. Um, you know, you can afford better software licenses. You know, and stuff like that. But, you know, I I don't think you know like I don't know like when I worked with startups a lot more like earlier in my career. You know, I, I don't think those. Um, companies were like bad people i mean there were some of them that sucked to work with but you know i think you can experience that at large companies as well um i I don't know i think it's just you know like you get you know you just individuals like you You just might get an individual people that are yeah very kind and and, you know pleasant to to interact with and work with yeah that 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 makes sense i'm glad you said it that way too because you might just get individuals who are just like bad managers they somehow got in and I, and I say I was asking because like that's not, that's something I'm actually trying to figure out because you know as you know I love affordability I love hyper affordable robotic solutions so I tend to get like clients who like you know are I don't know they just ask too much be, you know, it's a common problem with anything that's overly affordable um, and any any time I get a larger budget I tend that problem tends to go away but I do think it's true for like you know like and and it's good because like i i was i was i was thinking that's not it's not logical it's like i i feel like there has to be like bad a- eggs or bad apples everywhere right so yeah that makes sense i think that makes that makes more sense to what? me so yeah and i mean there's good eggs everywhere too <laughs> so there's yeah. there's a buddy of mine who's a lawyer and and he told me something i i thought was pretty funny and, and rang true to me which was um the smaller the amount of money the bigger the fight and so, like, I, I also true, yeah, yeah, also true, yeah. But it's it's interesting, right? Because like, you know, like Amazon, you know, dominated the market on affordability, as did Walmart, you know. And those are both. I love those companies. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're I mean, they're, so good, they're yeah. and and they're like in the Fortune ten, right? And so it's like, yeah, you know, they're they're the richest people in the world by creating, you know, affordable product. Um, but then you know, you look at some of the you know kind of things that have been created in their wake and you know it's like i don't know like i i sold a couple of laptops on ebay the other day and um you know i got scammed and some guy just sent back in like a box full of batteries and said they didn't get the laptops they ordered that's a that's actually a common problem on ebay electronics i actually watched a whole video on that yeah yeah basically don't use ebay well you know this right i'm not going to be selling anything else on ebay anymore it's just it's actually just the electronics field because that's where the highest margin is for yeah. scam for scamming people but yeah, yeah it's it's a yeah it's very bad on there yeah no it, i mean it definitely sucked um like i'm pretty sure the person that did it isn't even on shore cuz they you know like i obvious mail forwarding service that we sent these to you know I, I like looking at it and i mean i don't have the time to be ebaying stuff anymore so i delegated to someone who works for me and they they ship these out but I, know, I probably lost about like three thousand dollars on the operation, so I'm just like, eh. Mm. But you know, yeah. the grand scheme of things, it's like it's okay. That's not that much money. It'll be all right. And so, yeah, you know, it's like, um, but you know, lesson learned. You know, is like, okay, well, if the customer's always king, then sometimes the seller's going to get screwed. And I think that's kind of a yeah. bit of a side effect of that that low cost culture that you see. Um, and you know, like. You know, another example of that is like people like, I mean, you get this as, as an engineer who's selling like a low cost service. And I did this. I saw this more when I sold to startups was, you know, people want everything for no money and they're very demanding and they don't want to pay yeah. for it if it doesn't do exactly what they asked for. And you yeah, know, you're like, hey, so I mean, a lot of that just comes down to, I think, boundaries, vetting your customers and, you know, just setting expectations. Right. And so, you know, like just. I don't know. One thing that SKA Robotics does is is we work time and materials, right? And and you know that de-risks on the part of the company somewhat, but you know it also you know de-risks like the the scoping effort and the timeline on the part of the customer because when you go fixed flat, you know you have to spend. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm sure you've seen these like month, you know, to six month long scoping efforts where it's just a constant scoping. I've done a lot of those, yeah. Yeah, and you never get anything done, or like maybe it not, yeah. doesn't even kick off, and you spend forever on the scope and. So, you know, I just, you know, kind of said to heck with all of that and, you know, like, let's yeah. go TNM, you know, and, and that's been amazing. I mean, I have my friend kind of Ted Larson, the CEO of Ologic, to thank for putting that idea in my head. Uh, hey, Ted, how's it going, buddy? But, yeah. um, you know, he gave a talk a while ago and he talked about how Ologic only does TNM, you know, and I thought 
that's a great idea. I think SKA is only going to do TNM from now on. <laughs> so. it, that's funny because I actually added TNM to, to my services because of uh, you, actually. Oh, you, I'm, you glad put it, it in, I'm glad it rubbed off. <laughs> yeah, you put it in my head. Um, and I have TNM. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm facing, though, it's like a problem is I want to move towards TNM. But because my specific, you know, I'm trying to get my, my main value add is, is affordable full, so, full service robotics automation. Most of the time they're looking for fixed costs because they, they're trying to make sure their budget is a certain amount. And, and, and as you know, and um, meeting complex robotic deadlines is hard for me. Like your company is really good at it. Thank you. My company, my company is just, that's just not what I do. I, I try to solve really hard problems like really, really hard problems, but I can't necessarily guarantee a, a deadline easily. So then it's like, all right, well then I have to, I have to then have do fixed costs because you know, they, they make sure it doesn't go too much over their budget or something. I've gotten it to work fairly good. Um, so, but yeah, TN, TNM is just like, oh, if you can get that and that's just so much better. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's kind of like that triangle, right? Like good, fast and cheap pick two, you know? And exactly. So. Yeah. I mean, there's truth to that. I mean, like, and, and, you know, you can trade off, you know, budget for timeline, but like, I mean, that's the trade, you know, and I, 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 yeah. I kind of say like, I don't, I'm not going to compromise on, on good. Like, you know, I, I only want to put my name on things that are high quality. And so, you know, with, with SKA robotics, you can either, you know, do it cost effectively or fast, you know, or anywhere in between. I mean, like, you yeah. know, we can, we can move, you know, all different gears, you know, depending on what needs to be done, but you know, it's when you're when you try to move up against a really aggressive timeline. I mean, things get more expensive because, you know, you're having to, you know, do multiple engineering paths in parallel. And you saw this a bit on, on that project yeah, that I you and I have been that, talking yeah. about. And, yeah. you know, you're trying different algorithms at the same time to see, you know, what survives and what doesn't. And, you know, in a mechanical project, you might be sending, you know, parts to different machine shops or trying different technologies in tandem and then lab testing and seeing what works the best and then pairing off non-effective chains. And I think your internship program kind of does that to some extent too, with your approach to personnel development, you know, where you kind of allow people to sink or swim. And so, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of innovation that gets done in, in that kind of uh, fast pace, you know, crucible yeah. as it were. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. It's it's fun. I I know. Um, yeah, I I I believe most of the engineers enjoy it. But yeah, it's like here's a hard problem, and you know try to figure it out. Ask as much help as you mean if you need. But you know if you can't do it, then that's fine. We'll move you to something easier or something. But yeah, it's it's uh it's uh it's it's fun. I uh, hopefully they enjoy it. Yeah, so but much. would you have found that one like dude from the Philippines that's amazing? You know, if you hadn't just dumped on him, you know, like. Yeah, no, exactly. Hard. That's I, I agree. It's like that's what I had to do. Is just I take a random person. Uh, I have to vet them a little bit, qualify them. But it's easy to like fake your credentials or whatever. Um, ah. But have a qualification process, and then it's like I just gave them my hardest task. And in this particular case, it was it worked out. It, it doesn't always, but in this particular case, it just perfectly worked out. And I hopefully can work with them for a long time. So. So I, I saw in a guy's resume once, uh, it said soldering. This is back when SK had an internship program. Uh, we don't anymore. It's I, I've decided I, I can't afford the management yeah. overhead just with the hours. But this yeah. is something I think you're better at than me is, is cultivating intern talent. I mean, like that's something I kind of envy that you're able to do. But um, at the time, you know, we were still taking interns. And the one guy had soldering on his resume spelled S-A-U-T-E-R-I-N-G. And so, yeah. I, you know, I just I kind of confronted him. I'm like, why did you spell it that way? And he goes, oh, I, I dictated my resume to a friend on the drive over to the interview. <laughs> they printed it out and I picked it up and I guess they didn't know how to spell soldering. And so I'm like, all right, you know, that, you get some points for creativity and, and, you know, like being able to just in time something, you know, points lost for quality assurance. But, you know, I mean, you know, kind of everything all the time. So yeah. I thought that was kind of, you know, you can you can train a person like that that's, like, creative and, and resourceful in that way. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought that was kind of interesting. They ended up not working out, but I, I just I, I thought that was, you know, it's kind of something that they could have they could have lied or, you know, like, dug in, you know, and, and you know, embarrassed themselves. But instead they were just kind of, you know, came clean with it and were like, oh, yeah, I just told my friend to write my resume on the way over because I didn't have one yet. And I'm like, yeah, I guess you're a high school student. That's fair. 
know. Exactly. Yeah, high schoolers are tend to be very honest. But yeah, honesty is so important. It's the same thing with the internship program. Like, yeah, that's that's why I have so many interns because, like, it's I don't know. At least for me, it's hard to tell which ones are which. And there's a lot of people who kind of like they like, they're not they're not doing their job, but they like they they dig down into it. It's like you know, oh, I'm working hard, or oh, this is a hard problem, or oh, you gave me a hard problem. Or this or, there's always like reasons, and yeah, they are hard problems. But then there are other guys, like, you know, this one guy from the Philippines who, like, I'm not even sure if this is his area of expertise, um, but he just took the problem, and then he fixed it. That's awesome. Without asking any questions. Oh, he, well, he, he was very communicative. So one thing I, I mentioned to him was, like, he was, he was, like, <laughs> he was giving me, like, blocks of text, which was, like, too much for me. So that, that was a management issue I had to, um, but besides that, um, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you can work with people like that, right? I mean, there's there's one engineer that I work with, um, or I've been working with for like ten years now, and he's um he's kind of like that. Like he'll dump his whole thought process into emails, and you know, you just learn like, you know, that's with with that person in particular, that's more for him than it is for you. You know, I, I think he just needs yeah. to have that that log, you know, as it were, and and you know, that's like part of what he falls back on, and so. I don't know. Yeah, and, and you know, maybe to your point, maybe you'd be like, okay, dump that in a text file. Like, don't you know? Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, like I, I gave him this. Uh, cl- you, know, I, you know, I use ClickUp, so I said you can use ClickUp for that. But then it was hard for me to read it all. So it was still nice, though. Like he's like insanely yeah, smart. I'm like, compulsive dude... with like reading my Slack like that. Like I'll, I'll burn it down. You know, like yeah. if I have more than one unread, I'll, I'll start to get antsy about it. And... It actually kind of, I was on vacation last weekend. I, I kept reading the Slack and everyone was still working. I mean, well, I, I took Friday off. So mainly it was Friday. People were, there was all sorts of Slack traffic and I was just reading it and, you know, catching up and commenting and weighing in. And I'm like, I probably should chill out with that. Like, I, I, I mean, it's good to, I think, have eyeballs on what's going on. But at the same time, you know, like some of the people I've been hiring lately are, are just awesome. And I mean, a, a lot of the people I've worked with my whole career are awesome, but, you know, just having good people around that you can trust and know they know what they're doing and you don't have to babysit everything is, is really just a, a pleasant thing. Exactly. Yeah. I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with like initially having a lot of like having to watch over everything. But yeah, once you get to, once that trust factor kicks in, like with this, with this, uh, um, this guy from the Philippines, now that that trust factor kicked in, this is like, yeah, basically do whatever you want. You don't have to mention anything. Just ask me for help. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I think it's like, um, you know, yeah, you build up to that. I mean, I, I just hired, um, you know, a few people where I'm I'm still kind of building up. I, I our accounting team actually had some some recent uh, turnover. Um, lost a bookkeeper that was also doing accounts receivable. Um, it, just the work was getting, I think, a little bit too challenging for her with our account. She was fractional and. We had her doing all kinds of stuff that was outside of her comfort zone, and so she resigned, but gave notice. But So thought I had her backfilled. That person didn't work out. Backfilled her again. That person seems to be working out, but they're still onboarding, so there's you know there's this kind of yeah. moment now where they're, you know, they're making mistakes, but like understandable, like, you know, like I would make those mistakes, I think, figuring it out, you know, for the first time. Yeah. And so, you know, you kind of show some patience and you build up trust, you know, to your point and you comment when stuff doesn't work out privately and, you know, explain it. And then at the same time as that, I'm also bringing in like a, a fractional CFO. And so that's been interesting. Um, and so, you know, that person's, um, I, I really like them. I think they're going to work out really well, but you know, just onboarding, you know, like yeah. new accountants plus a CFO at the same time has been a bit much. Cause it's like basically the whole finance team now, like all of that, those people eventually will report to him. You know, it's um, you know, it's uh, it's been fun. It's you know, growing pains. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's one of those uh, good problems to have moments where, yeah, you have to grow, but it's good that you're you're growing. You're probably getting you know more clients and stuff. So, you know. Yeah, no, nice. I mean, I I think for the last three years, I mean, every year's revenue has been like more than the year before by like a good amount. And That's good. I, yeah. I think this year is gonna like, I mean. I don't know. Maybe the percentage is going to be slightly lower that we exceed last year's revenue by, but we're still going to exceed last year's revenue. Yeah. So it's it's you know just 
continuing to grow and, and it's really exciting. And then, you know, we'll see, like, I'm still, you know, we're only in Q2, so there's plenty of time to, to, yeah. you know, turn up the throttle on that and really blow it out of the water from the year before. So, you know, is there anything you want to plug while we're, while we're on the way out or do you? Uh, not really. Just like my website in general, there's just various stuff on there. If anyone wants to go and visit internship programs, products we're developing, services we offer, that's really it. So Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.